live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario. As you guys know, Vanderbilt football is not exactly very good. They're so bad that the last time they won a game in the SEC, and the last time they won a game in conference play, COVID was not even a thing. It was that long ago. They're coming off of a 55-3 loss to Alabama. They went 0-8 in conference play in 2021. They went 0-9 in conference play in 2020. And they lost their last four conference games of 2019. If you're doing the math, the Vanderbilt Commodores are 0-22 in their last 22 conference games. Which is absolutely abysmal. To the point where I genuinely think you could find a fair number of FCS teams that could take Vanderbilt's place and win at least one game in that stretch. The Commodores are the punching bag of the conference when it comes to football. However, they clearly like being in the SEC, because it's a perfect geographic fit, at a time where that doesn't seem to mean anything anymore, they're highly competitive in other sports, and it brings them a ton of revenue. Imagine if Vanderbilt wanted to leave the conference, but just for football, and then rejoin the conference later when they felt that the football program could compete again. In other words, they'd become an independent, just schedule random games across the country to play against teams that aren't leagues better than they are, and once their head coach or athletic director or whoever's in charge feels like they're ready to move up to the big leagues and play an SEC schedule again, they do. Almost like how if you're playing a video game, you might start off on the easiest difficulty before moving up to hard. Something like that seems absurd, right? How would that even work? Why would the conference ever agree to that? What kind of precedent does that set? How would scholarships and sponsorships work with all these contracts, assuming that the Commodores would be playing an SEC schedule and would be getting regular exposure on networks like ESPN because of it, and now they're playing an independent schedule? Obviously, this idea seems ridiculous. Vanderbilt has not proposed such an idea, as that was merely a hypothetical. But I brought that hypothetical up because, as you might have been able to guess, in 2000, a school actually tried to do this. Seriously. In 2000, the Virginia Military Institute, otherwise known as VMI, was a part of the Southern Conference, which had nine football members, including themselves. And in 2000, VMI, who was so bad at football, wanted to drop out of the conference on a temporary basis and take a bit of a hiatus until they could get their program fixed and up to par with the rest of the teams in the conference. And if you thought about the logistical nightmare that this presents, yeah, it went about as well as you'd expect. Because this is the story behind some of the dumbest conference realignment, if you could even call it that, in the history of the NCAA, and the bizarre and quite frankly, absurd drama between VMI and the Southern Conference. Before I talk about the proposal in question, we need some context to understand the makeup of the conference, as well as how VMI football was doing, to the point where they genuinely considered making this move. In 1981, VMI finished the season with a 6-3-1 record. Now, the year is 2000, and that was the last time that VMI had a winning record. Forget winning the Southern Conference, which they hadn't done since 1977. That 1981 season was the last time they even came inside the top four of the conference, as every other year had been spent at or near the cellar. In fact, from 1982 to 2000, in a period lasting roughly two decades, their highest finish in the conference was fifth place, which was in 1987. That was the only time in that stretch they finished higher than sixth. And don't get me wrong, VMI was a really bad football team. I mean, they were consistently one of the worst teams not just in the SOCON, but in all of Division I AA as it was known back then. But right around the turn of the millennium, things changed drastically. Because by the end of the 90s and the start of the 2000s, they weren't just your average bad. They were advanced bad. In 1996, they ended the season with a 26-14 loss to Appalachian State. That game kickstarted an absolutely abysmal losing streak where if you were entering the school in 1997 as a freshman, you genuinely wondered if you were ever going to see your team win a game in conference play while you were a student. 
What you've been watching this whole time has been a compilation from 1997 to 99 of some of those lowlights, of which there are way too many to count. In 1997, under new head coach Tim Kaine, VMI went 0-8 in conference play, and went 0-11 across all competitions. In 1998, they went 0-8 in conference play yet again. The good news was that they did manage to win a regular season game, so they ended the season 1-10. The bad news was that that win came against Lenore Rhine, a Division II school, so head coach Tim Kane was gone after two seasons where he had yet to win a Division I game. In 1999, VMI had a new head coach, with Cal McCombs now leading the charge. Once again, they went 1-10, with the one win coming against Concord West Virginia, a Division II school, and with the team going 0-8 in conference play. And in 2000, through the middle of October, when this incident took place, VMI was 0-7, with an 0-5 record in conference play. If you add everything up, from the end of the 1996 season, VMI was 2-35 over 37 games, winning 5.4% of the time. And those two wins were against Division II teams. So if we only count the games against Division I schools, VMI had lost an astonishing 35 straight, having not won one since November 16, 1996, when they beat the Citadel 34-27 in double overtime. For some perspective on how long ago that was, the number one song in the country on the Billboard Hot 100, the last time they won a Division I game, at the start of the month, was the freaking Macarena! We were in the year 2000 now. In the NFL, the Houston Oilers played their final game in Houston, moved to Memphis, then moved to Nashville, then changed their name and built a new stadium, and played in a Super Bowl. And all of this happened after VMI last won a game against a Division I school. It was that long ago. And it's not just that VMI was a really, really bad team, because trust me, they were. It was that they were playing in arguably the toughest conference in all of Division I-A in the SOCON. Take the 2000 season that's the focal point of our story, for example. Of the eight other teams in the SOCON, four of them finished the season ranked inside the top 25 of the Sports Network poll with Wofford ending the season at number 23, Furman ending at number 10, App State ending at number 4, and Georgia Southern finishing the season as the number one ranked team after defeating Montana State in the Division I AA National Championship game. Of the 16 teams to make it to the playoffs, three of them were from the SOCON. The SOCON was the only conference to send three teams, having the most representatives of any conference. So when you combine the fact that the Southern Conference was the best conference in Division I AA, and the fact that for the past few years, VMI had continually been the worst team in Division I AA, it seemed like VMI playing in this conference was really bad for them for obvious reasons. They just constantly kept losing. At this point, VMI had what seemed like three options. Option one was to keep everything the same, and just stay in the SOCON and tough it out. Option two was to drop down a division or two, get rid of scholarships, or even try and find a different conference that they could join where they'd be a bit more competitive. But they didn't really want to do that, seeing as they liked being in the SOCOM for other sports, and the SOCOM was, by far, the best geographic fit. The only other conference that even comes close to fitting geographically is the Atlantic 10. But aside from the fact that you don't know if the A-10 would even take them, it doesn't really solve the problem, as there were consistently good programs in that conference like Delaware, Richmond, UMass, James Madison, and Villanova. So you're just moving from one tough conference to another. And option three was to just drop football entirely. Although VMI didn't want to do that, since dropping football was a risky endeavor. It destroys morale, can lead to a significant loss in alumni support, and in many cases, the revenue brought in from football helps fund other sports. Plus, as athletic director Donnie White said quite bluntly, we want to play Division I AA scholarship football we feel that we're making improvements. We have a good coach and a good coaching staff. We're keeping more of our players. We know we're moving in the right direction. Safe to say, dropping football or dropping down to a lower division was not on the table. So what was VMI gonna do about this? Well, they had a fourth idea that was so ridiculous, and I don't think anyone even thought it was on the table. What if we just left the SOCON for a bit for football only? We become an independent in football until we can get this program to become competitive again. 
Maybe we'll schedule some easier opponents just to get the team and the fan base accustomed to winning and playing close and competitive games. And once we feel like it, we'll rejoin the conference. Now we've seen situations, like with Notre Dame and Army, where the football team is independent, and they're in a conference for other sports. But those are for very different reasons. They're not because they just flat out suck, and they're not on a temporary basis. It's not like Notre Dame is opting out of playing in the ACC because they don't think they can compete. But once they can, they'll join the conference. But then if they can again, they'll exit back out. VMI, on the other hand, was proposing a leave of absence where they'd be independent for football just until they got good again. And then they would rejoin the conference once they felt that they were back up to par. As VMI Superintendent Josiah Bunting said, we simply need to get this program better and stronger. And I don't think we're going to be able to do it successfully by playing against a level of competition which involves a number of the Southern Conference teams. Translation, we stink. We're not getting better. You guys are too good. So we want a Ross and Rachel style break from you guys for a bit. Where we're on a break, but we're not really on a break since we're still going to be involved in other sports. I'm sure I just started a firestorm in the comments section with that friends debate, but you get the idea. As for how this request was received, take a wild guess. The idea was received so poorly that I don't think a single person was in favor of it. The Southern Conference executives awarded VMI no points for having an idea this stupid, and wished that God would have mercy on their souls. VMI said that the reactions were mixed when they spoke to other schools, which if VMI was saying that they were mixed, tells you everything you need to know about just how poorly received this was because the response was pretty much universally negative. Gary Clark, the athletic director at Furman, said on VMI's proposal, I haven't heard anyone who seemed to be in favor of it. Sam Baker, the athletic director at Georgia Southern, said three words that sum up everything about the situation and why this was a terrible idea, saying, precedents are dangerous. And yeah, if you allow VMI to do this, think of the precedent that it sets. Can schools just leave the conference anytime they want? Can a school, if they wanted to save money, or they thought they were going to be rebuilding, just opt to be an independent for a bit? What happens if you wind up with just three teams playing in the conference that season because everyone else doesn't think that they're good, so they go independent? What about the TV networks that sign a deal with the conference under the assumption that the teams are staying in the conference, and now the teams fluctuate on a year-to-year -year basis? What about the impending litigation from people who had bonuses tied to conference wins and conference performance, and now aren't eligible for them because their school isn't even in a conference? I could be here all day, literally, if I listed every single problem that this precedent sets, because there are so many hypothetical scenarios to ponder here that would have lawyers salivating. Plus, something like this had never been done before. Sure, Davidson did it when they used to compete in the SoCon for football, left the conference, and then came back a few years later, but got permission to be an independent. But it was different with Davidson, because Davidson dropped all their scholarships for football, and the SOCOM was a scholarship-based conference. Compare that to VMI, who is going to retain all of their scholarships, and it's like apples and oranges. Officials in the SOCON, while sympathetic to the struggles that VMI faced as a military school, with an enrollment of only somewhere in the ballpark of 1,250, we're completely opposed to this idea, because it would just open up a giant can of worms. Today, VMI is still a member of the SOCON, even though they left for about a decade from the mid-2000s to the mid-2010s to join the Big South, which just started sponsoring football after spending two decades sponsoring other sports. And today, VMI is actually competitive again. Last season, VMI went 6-5, posting a winning record overall and a 500 record in conference play. And the year before that, during the spring season of 2021, since fall got canceled due to COVID, VMI actually won the conference, finished the season ranked number 11, and they made it to the playoffs for the first time ever before falling to James Madison in the first round. That is a far cry from the days of the start of the century, where they were so bad that they wanted nothing to do with the conference and wanted to play as an independent. Because back in 2000, even though things were trending in a southern direction, the Southern Conference wasn't going to let them off the hook. 
Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.